more than 100,000 gallons of crude oil spilled into the ocean off the Orange County coastline more than a week ago. While the worst of it may have dissipated, the impact of that toxic leak will be long felt. The oil seeped into sensitive wetland areas, closing beaches, sliming plants, and coating wildlife and birds, some of those on a list of threatened species. They can either die or get very sick very quickly. We take a look at the extent of the damage and the people who are doing their best to heal the affected wildlife. It is an outrage that Congress has failed to prevent this damaging oil spill. And while the experts work on repairing the damage, local leaders look at how to prevent this from ever happening again. And as kids settle into the back to school rhythm, some are finding themselves struggling. The pandemic has led to a number of students falling behind, but tutors are helping to fill those gaps. I am seeing way more students than I've ever seen before. We talked to some of those tutors about how they are helping as Fox 11 News In Depth starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Marla Tejas in for host Hal Eisner. The tragedy continues to grow along the coast of Southern California after thousands of gallons of oil gushed into the waters right off of Orange County. In response to that environmental disaster, there was an immediate cry to ban drilling off California's waters. One of those speaking out in support of legislation to ban offshore drilling is U.S. Congressman Ted Lieu. He represents California's District 33, which contains some of the area's most beautiful beaches. So we welcome Congressman Lieu to in depth this week. Thank you so much for being with us, Congressman. Let's let's just start off right out of the gate just to clear up some of the confusion out there. There is already a ban on drilling in state waters off of California. Isn't that right? So there's a difference between state waters and federal waters. State waters extend about three miles, nautical miles off the coast of California. Federal waters go from three nautical miles to about 200. This particular oil spill occurred at a platform that was about nine miles off the coast in federal waters. Okay, so there's not a ban there, but you are, as I said, you want legislation that does, in fact, lead to that. We heard from Senator Alex Padilla uh, in the open there saying that this is an outrage, that this is happening. What does your legislation specifically say? I'm a co-author of the West Coast Ocean Protection Act, which was introduced by Senator Feinstein and Congressman Jared Huffman, and that would permanently ban offshore oil drilling in federal waters along the Pacific coast. There is currently an administrative moratorium. However, the administration could change that. And during the Trump administration, they did try to expand offshore oil drilling off the Pacific coast. What's the pushback? What is the likelihood that this is going to become reality? What are you up against? or up against fossil fuel interests. I do note that there is bipartisan support for banning offshore oil drilling. And this is something that does repeat itself. It was only in 2015 when a large oil spill occurred off the coast of Santa Barbara. And that oil spill also went down and affected my district with tar balls coming up on Manhattan Beach and Redondo Beach. So this is something that's happening repeatedly, and that's why we have to ban offshore oil drilling. Dating back to 1969, the Santa Barbara spill, which is horrific, the state has not approved a single new lease, but has permitted new drilling on existing leases. And Governor Newsom sort of hangs his hat on that, if I'm not mistaken, that, you know, I'm not allowing new uh, drilling companies to come in there, but we have it still as this problem. Uh, that's a very good point. So we're also looking at legislation that's going to lift some of the caps on penalties right now when there is an oil spill uh, for these oil companies. And you have a lot of aging infrastructure. They're not modernizing. And we want to make sure that if there's going to be future oil spills, that they actually are hit with their appropriate penalties, and we believe if we can lift the caps and increase the penalties, then either they're going to modernize or they're going to stop drilling. Uh, what, what about rising gas prices? I mean, it's such a problem here in Los Angeles. I mean, we're seeing $5 a gallon for people who see this oil spill and you think of rising gas prices. What do you say to them? Uh, it turns out that offshore oil drilling, especially along the Pacific Coast, amounts to a fraction of all the oil in the United States. So it's not gonna have a large impact on oil prices and the environmental damage is just catastrophic anytime there is an oil spill. 
what can we do besides this? Is there anything that the state can do more to lessen the demand on oil and gas? So first of all, I'm pleased that the California State Attorney General, Rob Bonta, has initiated an investigation into uh, what caused this oil spill. And obviously, any uh, oil platform in federal waters, that pipeline is going to run through both federal and state waters. We also have to move to renewable energies and clean energy. I'm very pleased that a number of car manufacturers, both in the U.S. as well as foreign car manufacturers, have committed to going to full electric by approximately 2030 or 2035. And as we start to go to more electric cars, the need for oil will also lessen. Now, your district, District 33, as mentioned, it includes some of the beach cities, uh, the coastline there. Uh, I suspect that you have been down to see the impact of the oil spill yourself. Let's, I, I wanna get your take when you were there. What did you see? What was your takeaway? So I remember when in 2015, the Santa Barbara oil spill affected the entire South Bay and I would see these tar balls that would basically roll up on the beaches. And the one in Huntington, it's also affecting not just Huntington, but also Newport. And again, you have a similar situation, not only with tar balls, but also just oil uh, in the water. I'm pleased though, that with cleanup efforts and really all the stakeholders engaging, that they have reopened uh, the beaches uh, in a number of their places. But we have to make sure that this doesn't keep happening. I also want to note that the Build Back Better legislation also currently has a provision in there that would also ban offshore oil drilling. All right. For, for complete clarification for the federal and state, because I know it's a little bit confusing, uh, state waters, it's three miles off the coast. And then once you go beyond that three mile, then you enter federal territory, correct? That is correct. Three nautical miles off the coast and then federal waters are three miles to about 200 nautical miles. OK, so getting back to the legislation that you are the co-author of, how soon would we expect to see action taken on this? So hopefully we could get this done during this congressional term, which will either be before the end of this year or sometime next year. Again, we are seeing increasing calls on both parties to ban offshore oil drilling and it is something that people understand large catastrophic environmental damages anytime there's an offshore oil spill. We always appreciate to see bipartisanship, don't we, Congressman Lowe? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it there. Congressman Ted Lou, District 33, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you. Coming up next on Fox 11 News In Depth, we look at the toll that the oil spill has taken on wildlife and those who are experts in cleaning up the damage and rescuing the innocent lives caught in those oil slicks. Stay with us. The consequences of that oil spill were grave. More than a dozen dead birds have been found so far, including federally threatened animals, but others are recovering through special care. Joining us to talk about that is the CEO of International Bird Rescue. His name is J.D. Bergeron. J.D., thank you so much for being with us. Let's just start with the basis, basics and tell people uh, International Bird Rescue, what is it and how did it get its start? Yeah, we are a 50-year-old nonprofit organization. Um, sadly enough, we were started in response to a major oil spill in San Francisco back in 1971. At the time, there was no uh, accepted practice for what to do with oiled animals. And so we have spent 50 years trying to perfect uh, the ways that not only you remove oil, but also how do you rehabilitate birds that live in and on water. Uh, so here we are 50 years later, unfortunately, coming back to the kind of work that we started with. OK, so let's talk specifically about the Orange County oil spill and your role there. Obviously, you're out there along the shorelines in those wetland areas rescuing birds. How has that rescue process been thus far? Our team is, is here in support of the Oiled Wildlife Care Network. We are one of the member organizations and some of our staff are uh, have the right experience to do that search and rescue work. In fact, uh, one of the first live oiled animals that was picked up was picked up by one of our team members. That was a, a ruddy duck. Uh, those who don't mm -hmm. know their birds, it's a small duck from up north. Fortunately, that bird actually was released today. 
Uh, the other half of the team is working in our care center, uh, doing the hands-on work uh, that it takes to get those birds strong enough for a wash, get them clean, make sure that their waterproofing is in place, and ultimately prepare them for release again. How many have been released uh, so far? You just mentioned the ruddy duck that was released today. Yeah, those are the very first two of all the birds that have come in. Um, it is uh, really fortunate uh, that both of them, it was uh, an eared grebe that went with it, uh, maybe a little less familiar to most people, but both are birds that live along the coastline, mm. uh, right where, unfortunately, oil spills, when they happen, tend to gather. Yeah, we're so happy to hear that. Uh, what, what is the process, though, specifically of rehabilitating uh, these birds? I know Dawn dishwashing liquid really helps get that oil, but that can't be enough, right? You know, it is uh, one of the things I always like to, to remind people is please do not try this at home. Uh, it is work to be done by professionals. Uh, it seems very simple when you watch the commercial. Um, you know, it, it seems like a quick and easy, but really the, the critical piece here is to make sure that the bird is strong enough to go through that wash process. Uh, it is not the case that we wash them immediately. Um, it is true that we work with Dawn dish soap. It is uh, quick and uh, easy on the bird's feathers and skin, which is great. Sometimes it does require pretreatment to break up the oil um, ahead of that. And then of course, a thorough rinse process. It's not just a wash process. It's also really important to get all of the soap and any other residue off of the feathers. And we like to say that at that point, we're trying to set the bird up to do the work that needs to happen. It's the preening of the feathers. It's mm -hmm. the fluffing up. It's the, it's the basically the bird living uh, a natural way while in care uh, that allows it to reestablish waterproofing. And it's our job just to make sure that's progressing exactly as it should. You, you said don't try this at home. Uh, if people come across uh, an oiled bird, what should they do? The best possible thing is to call the uh, 800 number, 877-UCD-OWCN. That's uh, uh, basically the hotline. There are trained teams who will come and swoop in. Best thing you can do is actually make very good note of where exactly you are. Uh, the faster the folks can get there to pick that bird up, the better chance it has. Uh, a reminder that oil is a uh, chemical, it's dangerous, it's poisonous on your skin. Uh, so, and, and also those birds are, are uh, potentially hurt, sick, and sometimes even they can be dangerous. Um, they've, got, they've got weapons to defend themselves. So best thing is to call in the professionals as quickly as possible. All right, you said that International Bird Rescue started five decades ago uh, out of the need for rescuing these wildlife and specifically an oil spill. What have you learned over the years uh, treating wildlife in previous oil spills that you're putting into practice today? It's important to note that we actually run two full-time rehabilitation centers for, especially for uh, water birds, not just for birds that are oiled, but for fishing hook injuries, uh, cat bites, uh, hit by a car, just sick and emaciated. These, there are lots of challenges, um, most of them caused by, unfortunately, by people um, that these birds face. Um, through the years, we've learned ways to uh, put them in proper enclosures. A lot of these birds that spend their time, for example, uh, in, the, in the ocean, um, their feet are not really well uh, adapted to be walking on the beach or sometimes even their body shape is not perfect for, for being able to walk around. So there's often secondary injuries. Those mm. are the kinds of things you have to watch very carefully. Um, and so that's, uh, that's really the, the magic here is, is the the soap and and uh, rinse help to get the the actual contamination clear, but it really is the the skill set of these folks who feed the birds, check their their blood values, uh, make sure that they're progressing appropriately, and that we're we're protecting against any secondary injuries. Well, you do incredible work, uh, International Bird Rescue CEO J.D. Bergeron. Thank you for all that you do, and thanks for being with us today. All right, coming up next on Fox 11 News In Depth. Sometimes time in the classroom is not enough. Some students have fallen behind because of the pandemic and distance learning. After the break, we talk to some local experts on tutoring and how it can help bridge the gap.
recent study found today's students will earn $50,000 less over their lifetime. That's on the low end, too, because of the pandemic's impact on their education. That is a pretty scary statistic. And for elementary school kids going back to class this fall, some estimates say they've lost months of learning. What are students and parents to do when it feels like it's impossible to catch up? Well, that's where a tutor can be a lifesaver. Joining us is Miles Hunter. He's the CEO and co-founder of Tutor Me. And with him, Ali McGlone is one of their tutors. Thank you both for being with us. Miles, you're up first. I want to hear from you, your experience thus far post-pandemic. What sort of predicament are you finding kids to be in? So I think kind of the obvious is that students are, are really falling behind in school because of the distance learning that wasn't really prepared for. Um, so we're seeing a, a huge need for students um, really needing academic support uh, and getting that one-on-one -on -one tutoring to get back on track uh, and to avoid this COVID slide. 2016 is when you founded Tutor Me. Have you seen an increase in business because of the Absolutely. pandemic? We, yeah, we definitely could attribute it a lot to the pandemic. Um, the the company has, has grown tremendously uh, headcount wise, and then we've seen um, a huge amount of tutoring surge. Um, so about 5x since the pandemic started. Wow, five times. Okay, um, Ali, uh, as a tutor, you work directly with these students. What have you been experienced? What's been the main struggle? Well, for a lot of the younger kids, it's really, really difficult to stay focused on online lessons. And so a lot of the time they need someone to help keep them on track. I have had students also tell me that they feel like they are a year or more behind mm -hmm. in their study. And they don't feel prepared for the grade that they're in currently. So I definitely see a lot of that pandemic backslide going on. Wow, we said months of learning loss and these kids are telling you a year behind. When, you, when you're talking to these kids or, or parents, how, how do they play the catch up game? Is it possible? I think it's really, really difficult, but I definitely think that having that one-on-one -on -one support is really important. Um, parents don't always have time to help their kids with whatever they might need. And I know teachers are really, really busy with multiple students. So I think that tutoring is actually like very, very important to that process. Yeah, it's a nice supplement, uh, no question. Miles, how is Tutor Me different from conventional uh, tutor programs, if I'm not mistaken, yours is just online. That's correct, Marlo. So we're completely online. We've been since day one. Um, students can go on the platform and connect with a tutor, uh, typically under 30 seconds. Um, so there's no scheduling needed. So you're able to really um, break through physical barriers where a lot of students, um, from a convenience standpoint, it's helpful. But then uh, more importantly, a lot of students feel uh, a little bit timid reaching out when there's a, that physical barrier. Uh, and that's really knocked down when it becomes virtual. And the age range? Um, we tutor all the way from kindergarten through graduate school. So we have um, medical students, um, pharmacy students, um, and then all the way down to, to kindergarten. I, I know a lot of parents watching, you know, we think of cost. That when you say, oh, you know, a tutor would be great for your child, but we just can't afford it. How do you uh, break through that? How do you budget this? So pre-pandemic, that, that, that answer would be, well, you know, we do have a consumer model where parents can come on and pay for it directly. Um, but we, our real core focus is working directly with school districts, universities, and colleges uh, to get that tutoring for free um, directly to the student. Um, so now that, we're, now that the pandemic has, has, has happened, um, we've seen a huge surge in money being thrown into uh, the education space uh, to really get students back on track. So um, part of that is the Amer American Rescue Plan, $123 billion. Uh, Twenty percent of that is earmarked specifically for getting students back on track to avoid uh, that COVID loss. Um, so a big part of getting students on track is tutoring. So um, the, I guess the point is that there's a lot of money um, being distributed to schools um, that they can pay for tutoring, like from Tutor Me, mm. uh, and then the, the actual students and the parents are not paying for this. Ali, uh, money and time, time and money. Uh, how much time uh, is good for a tutor session? 30 minutes, an hour? And what's, how much satisfaction do you get out of working with students? Well, the timing for tutoring sessions varies depending on the kind of help that a student needs. 
But if they need a lot of attention, usually it's about an hour. A lot of the schools will put hour limits on the tutoring sessions. Um, so I can't work with the student sometimes for more than 60 minutes, but mm. often they will use up that whole time. And is this once a week? I think it's, I, I don't think it's um, any specific like period of time. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I just didn't know if, um, you know, obviously the more tutoring, the better, right? I mean, it's just extra education for, for kids. And yeah, l let me ask you that about just a, a satisfying experience. Uh, post pandemic, I mean, kids are turning to you for help. And, and what's that like for you? I do get a lot of satisfaction out of being able to help students catch up and um, learn subjects that they've struggled with. I recently had a student message me saying that I had helped her pass her reading test and she was excited and grateful. So that was definitely a satisfying moment. Uh, how satisfying is that for you to hear founder, Miles? <laughs> I, I love that. It, it's really great. Um, I think that there's a real connection between students and tutors that goes beyond academics. Um, oftentimes, especially now with the pandemic, you have social emotional support um, where tutors are really helping students gain confidence in what they do. And a lot of what they what they attribute confidence to is how they excel academically. So I think that the, the human nature between a student and a tutor uh, is absolutely invaluable. All right, Miles and Allie, thank you so much for being with us. They're from Tutor Me. Thanks so much. Thank you, Myla. Thank you. We'll be right back with more in depth after the break. Stay with us. That's it for this week's Fox 11 News in Depth. Thank you for being with us. Before we go, let's take a look at an epic excuse one student submitted to his teacher when he had to miss class. I guess it helps when you're friends with Lin-Manuel Miranda. Ms. Rossner, this is Lin-Manuel Miranda. I'm sorry uh, he can't be in US history class right now, but he's with me. We're gonna go over Bill of Rights um, and anything you may be covering right now. We cover we cover a lot of it in about two and a half hours at Hamilton, but we're going to go over it in specifics now. So this is not lost time. Thank you. <laughs> 